Hello, my name is Eric Peterson. I'm a neuroradiologist here at Creighton University uh, Medical Center in Bergen Mercy. Um, and uh, I just want to talk to you very briefly about some cervical spine fractures uh, and common uh, and their common associated mechanisms. So I think the first thing we should start up to talk about as we uh, discuss cervical fractures is um, a little bit of normal cervical anatomy um, and uh, with an emphasis on alignment. Uh, and so uh, many of you have probably seen some form of this picture before. Um, there's basically four sets of lines uh, that we look at um, on uh, every kind of spinal imaging study um, that we do. And in fact, uh, those of you who sit with me during the day know that uh, literally the first sentence of every spine report that I dictate uh, throughout the course of every day uh, basically talks about the alignment. Um, and so what am I looking at when we're assessing the alignment? Uh, we look at four lines. So there's this anterior vertebral line which is drawn across the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. There's the posterior vertebral line that's drawn across the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. There's the spinal laminar line that's drawn across the underside of the spinous processes. And then there's the posterior spinous line, which is really more of a posterior spinous arc um, that has the basically drawn across the posterior tips of the spinous processes. Um, and so if everything looks like this, uh, then it's normal. Um, also, I'll just point out that you can also uh, assess the alignment of the facet joints, which you can see here, uh, the inferior articular processes articulating with the superior articular process below. Uh, at every single level. They're stacked up, uh, kind of like flying buttresses, basically. Okay, so um, here we have uh, midline sagittal, um, uh, off midline sagittal, and coronal reconstructions from a, a normal cervical spine CT. Again, if you're assessing the alignment here, you can see the uh, anterior vertebral line, posterior vertebral line, spinal laminar line, and posterior spinous line uh, are all normal. Um, all the vertebral body heights uh, look normal. Um, this off uh, sagittal uh, view <clears throat> actually shows the alignment of the occipital condyle with the lateral mass of C1, shows the lateral mass of C1 articulating with the lateral mass of C2, and then we can look at all the facets that are neatly stacked on top of each other here, normal alignment in the parasagittal view. And then on the coronal view, uh, that's an important uh, view to look at uh, the alignment at the craniocervical junction and the alignment at the C1, C2 articu articulation. You'll see that the occipital condyles here articulate nicely with the lateral masses of C1 um, and the lateral masses of C1 articulate nicely with the lateral masses of C2. This is the odontoid process of C2. Here's an axial view <coughs> of one of the upper cervical levels. Um, and this just shows uh, the vertebral body, uh, the pedicle, uh, the facet, the lamina, and then the spinous process comes back this way. On the bone algorithm, you can see we get nice detail of the cortex and the medullary bone. We have transverse processes and the transverse foramina uh, in which the vertebral arteries uh, run. And the soft tissue window just shows that uh, on most patients you can see the spinal cord and some cerebral spinal fluid that's lower attenuation surrounding it. So here's our first abnormal example. Um, you'll notice right away that if you try to draw your lines here, um, they're all abnormal. The anterior spinal line is off, the posterior spinal line is off, the spinal laminar line is off, <clears throat> there's increased distance. Uh, between the uh, C4 and C5 spinous processes here. Um, and you can see that this facet is a little bit subluxed here. Now this was a uh, cross table lateral in the trauma bay. By the time they got over to CT, um, I don't know whether they didn't stabilize this patient very well, but you can see that the subluxation uh, of C4 on C5 is actually worse. There's a fracture fragment here. We've kind of sheared off the top of C5. Um, but you can see that none of your lines line up. Uh, and then here's our off, uh, off uh, midline <laughs> sagittal view, excuse me, <clears throat> that actually shows uh, the facet is completely jumped. 
um, this inferior articular process surface here should actually articulate with this surface here. So this is completely subluxed, and, and this subluxation is actually what allows this anterior slippage, this anterolisthesis or anterior subluxation to happen. So here's an MRI of the same patient. Um, as you might surmise, um, in order for those facets to sublux like that, uh, we're generally dealing with some torn ligamentous structures that kind of holds that all together. Uh, and so MRI is great for looking at the cervical spinal cord and the cervical ligamentous structures. Um, and what you can see here is the subluxation of C4 and C5. Here's the anterior longitudinal ligament. It's a little bit stretched, but it looks intact. The posterior longitudinal ligament is frankly disrupted. You can see it come up and then just stop right here. Um, the uh, ligamentum flavum is also frankly disrupted. You can see this black line comes up and then just stops. There's a gap in it right here. So this ligamentous injury is actually what allows um, those facets to sublux and the vertebral bodies to sublux. You can see that the cord is compressed here. There's maybe even a little bit of elevated signal within the cord signifying edema and cord injury. Um, there's all kinds of edema posteriorly here. Um, and there's even a little bit of an epidural collection uh, along the backs of the vertebral bodies here uh, in the upper cervical spine. So what's the mechanism uh, behind uh, this? Uh, this is an important one to know. It's a hyperflexion injury. It's the prototypical whiplash injury. Um, it's important uh, and uh, when it's associated uh, with facet dislocation, <coughs> uh, this is an unstable uh, injury that requires uh, surgery to fix. Here's a different injury. Um, you can see on the cervical spine here, uh, the alignment of the structures is pretty good if you follow the lines. Um, there is a, a little bit of a gap here between the posterior arch of C1 and C2 that's increased, um, but you can actually see a fracture line extending through the pedicles of this C2 uh, vertebral body. And we'll take a look at that on the CT. Again, if you're looking at midline sagittal, the alignment is pretty good. There you may suspect that there's a little problem here between C1 and C2. <laughs> if you go off sagittal here, you can see that there's a fracture of the pedicle on both sides uh, of C2. And then here we are on the axial images showing those pedicle fractures bilaterally at C2. So what's the mechanism here? Well, this is the prototypical hyperextension injury. Um, this is called a hangman's fracture, uh, and that's uh, related to generally the, the, um, the knot in the noose uh, they would put underneath the, uh, the, uh, the poor person's chin, uh, and then uh, when the platform came out from underneath them, it would uh, result in sudden uh, hyper, uh, hyper extension uh, of the neck. Um, and often uh, create this particular fracture. Um, these can be unstable if they're associated with ligamentous injury. Um, this is an open mouth odontoid view. Um, so literally shot through the open mouth of the patient. And uh, what we should notice here is if you look at the alignment of the lateral masses of C1, and the lateral masses of C2. The lateral masses of C1 are kind of positioned laterally to the lateral masses of C2. There's some overhang here that shouldn't be there. The odontoid looks intact. If we CT this, again, we can see more pronounced. It looks like the lateral masses of C1 are further apart than they should be. They don't really articulate normally with either the occipital condyles or the lateral masses of C2. And when we look at the axial image through the C1 ring, we can actually see that the C1 ring is completely exploded. There's fractures of the anterior arch on both sides and the posterior arch on both sides. And uh, so the classic mechanism that goes along with this particular fracture is axial loading. So this would be the prototypical diving injury where somebody dives into shallow water in a swimming pool or off a dock in a lake uh, and basically lands on the top of their head um, and results in a Jefferson fracture is the acronym that goes along with this uh, C1 ring uh, <clears throat> blowout fracture. Uh, and this can be unstable if the transverse ligament is disrupted. Uh, lastly, uh, this is a very common fracture that we see frequently. Again, we're starting with another open mouth odontoid view. 
um, the shot through the open mouth. And in this case, you can see that these lateral masses of C1 look like they're pretty normally aligned with the lateral masses of C2, but we've got this linear lucency that extends through the base of the odontoid process of C2, and that's a fracture. Uh, so here on the CT, you can again see the fracture extending through the base of the odontoid process of C2. It looks like the occipital condyles and the lateral masses of C1 and the lateral masses of C2 are all pretty normally aligned. Um, here on the lateral uh, or the sagittal reconstructions, uh, you can see the fracture line extending through the base of the odontoid. The odontoid fracture fragment is in anatomic position. It articulates normally with the anterior arch of C1. Um, but uh, this is a classic uh, type 2 odontoid fracture. So the mechanism for these can be variable. We see a lot of these in patients who just fall uh, either from height or from uh, ground level. Uh, it's just extremely common. Uh, fracture, uh, and it's uh, the type 2 odontoid fracture through the base of the odontoid itself. Um, so these can be unstable, uh, and they have a high risk of, uh, of non-union uh, over time uh, without proper fixation. And that is your brief tour of cervical spine fractures.